Cool. I've got, I think, even more slides, but a lot of them, again, are like quick ones to like buzz through. Ones, so. yeah. They were great. My mom uh, commented yesterday. She was watching all of them. She was watching the program. And she said, I really like how we did the ocean and the lake. That part was great. Yeah. It made me think. Yeah, yeah no, it was, um, it was a good comparison. It's a good way to bring all of this about. Yeah, it's like I'm always coming, trying to come up with new ways to show stuff like that that resonates with people. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it worked really well. All right. Well, I will go ahead and kick us off then. And let me refresh this page. Okay. Ready to go? I am ready. All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our second day in our Great Lakes Adventures Chautauqua Lecture Series program. Um, my name is Dakota Harkins. I'm the Director of Education and Heritage Programming here at Lakeside Chautauqua. Today, we're going to be continuing the theme that we started yesterday with Matt Kovach, who's back again. But before I welcome him back, I just want to send out a few quick reminders again. Uh, we are streaming all of our programs um, on Facebook now. So all of our Chautauqua Lecture Series programs can be viewed on Facebook. But if you want to join in the webinar where you can ask direct questions to our speakers, you can always go to our Chautauqua Lecture Series calendar. So if you go to lakesideohio.com backslash calendar and click on the purple banner that's at the top of each of the dates, that will take you to a page that has all the webinars for the week. Um, so each of those webinars you can attend as a Zoom participant and send questions directly into the conversation. Um, if you have any questions, again, throughout the season about how to access any of our programs or about the calendar and who's coming up next week, uh, check your Lakesider or the website or contact me at dharkins at lakesideohio.com. Um, and with that, I want to kick it over as soon as possible to Matt today, who is returning. Um, we had a lot of questions yesterday, and I know that he's already been incorporating some of those into his program for today. So welcome back, Matt. It's good to have you again. Thank you. All right. Well, I will. Uh, yeah. I, so I, uh, I guess let me share my screen first. And I'll get the PowerPoint presentation going. All right, hopefully you can see that. So yeah, thank you again for letting me uh, bother you guys for an hour, hour and a half or whatever. So this is kind of part two of this uh, uh, lecture series or whatever you want to call it. Um, part one was really based on uh, the past of Lake Erie. So it was environmental challenges along Lake Erie's coastline. Oh, you know what? I didn't upgrade, update the uh, title slide here, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yesterday was the past to the present. Today is kind of like taking the present and looking into the future. Uh, and kind of based on some of the feedback from yesterday, um, one of the things that I decided to do uh, is to try to jump into these things by doing kind of a bit more of a, a series of case studies on some of these environmental challenges that hopefully will resonate and uh, give you the background to kind of understand how these things apply to other locations. Um, with that, oh, first off, you didn't have to have uh, seen the first one to see this, although it would give you some extra context. So if you do want to watch that again, you know, feel free. I think Dakota's got it uh, up on Facebook and everything. So go for it. Um, so again, uh, sorry you have to hear this again if you uh, were here yesterday um, about me. My name's Matt Kovac. Uh, I'm from Marblehead originally, and I grew up here, and I'm, I don't know, fourth or fifth generation. I'm not entirely sure how you uh, calculate that. Um, but anyway, so I'm from here. Uh, I grew up, went to Danbury High School, graduated from there. I uh, went to Miami University in Ohio, got an uh, undergraduate degree in uh, zoology and environmental science. I got a master's degree from the University of North Texas in aquatic ecology and aquatic and ecotoxicology. Um, uh, these pictures, the top left, that's me and my son out in one of the Lake Erie marshes. Uh, bottom left is me. I used to run charter boats for Tibbles Marina uh, when I was a kid and had less gray hair than I have today. Um, top right, my wife and I scuba diving on Lake Erie. The bottom right, my wife and I getting married on Lake Erie. So Lake Erie's had a really big impact on me and what I'm doing and is really why I'm here today. And the reason I'm doing the stuff that I'm doing is really for this little guy. You know, I grew up here and I didn't have a sense of appreciation of the natural resources that are here. And I'm trying, one of my goals in life is to help people develop more of an appreciation for that in, in ways that, you know, I, me and a lot of my peers and people growing up didn't really have. So I showed you this yesterday. Those guys that didn't see this before, 
uh, just really quick and go over this again. Uh, the Lorax, Dr. Seuss is the Lorax. Um, originally, Lake Erie was so bad and so badly polluted back when he wrote this that he had a call out to Lake Erie. And that's something that is worth remembering, but it's also something that kind of can help drive us to, to making the world a better place for the future. Um, and again, the same quote. Um, I hope that I'm that person or one of those people that cares an awful lot and is, is helping to drive that change, not just for me, but for future generations too. Um, who am I not? Uh, this is really relevant to today's talk. And who I am not is I am not Clint Eastwood starring as Harry Callahan in Magnum Force. Now, first of all, uh, I realize that picture is not uh, Harry Callahan in that movie, but at the same time, I like the picture of Clint Eastwood. Um, the reason I put that on here is a man has got to know his limitations, right? That's one of the quotes from, from the movie. And uh, that's really, really important in dealing with environmental issues because these are very complicated, very complex things. Nobody has all of the answers. The only way we're gonna solve these things is by collaborating and working with the people that do know more than we do. So there's a handful of takeaways in this presentation. And the first one that I hope you guys all get from this is that environmental problems are very, very complex. These are not things that are easy to solve. These are not things that were easy to uh, get to the state where we are today. Um, and here is just a smattering of all of the partners that we work with in doing these issues, whether it be funding sources or state and federal agencies or other NGOs, universities, all of these other groups get together to, to do conservation work, the type of work that, that I do. So a little bit more about me and who I work for. So I work for the Nature Conservancy uh, and we are a global nonprofit organization. I don't know if you guys can see uh, uh, the little screen of me moving around. If so, um, apologize. So the Nature Conservancy, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we are an international organization and we work in all 50 states as well as 79 countries and territories. And our mission is to conserve the lands and waters upon which all life depends. Uh, we own and manage an awful lot of, of land. And in Ohio specifically, there's over 60,000 acres of protected land that we've been involved in. Our website is nature.org. And one of the things I highlighted at the bottom is that we pursue non-confrontational pragmatic solutions to conservation challenges. There are other environmental groups out there um, that are not us, and I am in no way uh, condemning those organizations uh, for the how they approach conservation challenges and environmental solutions. This is just the way that we work. We tend to not work through lawsuits and things like that. We try to work by finding, finding the ways that we can work like this together as opposed to doing this. Uh, because, you know, we realize we you know, I drive a car to work. Well, uh, not anymore because of COVID, you know, but, but we live here and, we, you know, our hope is that we can create a world where humans and natures can thrive together. And we feel that that's really important and that's the best way for us to achieve our mission. So um, in terms of how you can help uh, supporting organizations like the Nature Conservancy is certainly one of those. So um, moving on, takeaway number two, uh, environmental science is essentially an exercise in trade-offs. And that's something, that's one of the big things that I hope you guys get out of this presentation today is that these are complicated issues as well as they do not, they come with trade-offs, right? There are no, uh, there are very, very, very few, um, you know, wins all the way around. Uh, it's, it's much more challenging than that. So I'm not gonna give a ton of background about the Great Lakes. Uh, some of this, we covered much more of this yesterday, but at least a little bit of information, some of which is going to be review if you were here yesterday, is really important to kind of set the stage for the current environmental issues that we're going to be talking about. The biggest ones are listed underneath here, being water levels, invasive species, and harmful algal blooms. And within that is also, we're going to touch a little bit on wetland restoration and central basin dead zone issues. So the Great Lakes, um, all of you guys are familiar with this. It uses 20% of the world's fresh water is found right here in the Great Lakes. I believe you guys can see my cursor. You know, uh, this is Lake Erie. Uh, lakeside is right around here. Um, the area you can see from the Lakeside Dock is really pretty small in relation to the entirety of Lake Erie. The Great Lakes were formed following the last ice age. This is really important because how these lakes formed and how these ecosystems formed really determines the condition that we're in today. 
and the environmental challenges that we face today. So I'm not gonna go into nearly as much detail on this as we did yesterday, but generally as the, um, at the end of the last ice ages, the glaciers were leaving, they kind of left behind water and, and the geology that formed the Great Lakes that we see today. And the water levels in the Great Lakes, obviously water level fluctuations is something we're gonna talk of, you know, do a deeper dive on today. They've always been fluctuating in Lake Erie since it was initially formed, you know, during the Lake Maumee stage, which you can see kind of back here, uh, where the elevation was about 800 feet, 790 feet or so, um, compared to today where water level is about 574 feet. So water levels have always fluctuated. And what's left after those glaciers left is essentially the configuration of the Great Lakes today. So Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, Lake Erie, and then that flows into Lake Ontario. The Great Lakes flow. And I think everyone realizes this, but we don't necessarily think about them as like a riverine system. But essentially, the Great Lakes are nothing more than a series of really big pools on a really, really big river. So we start at the highest elevation of Lake Superior, which sits at 600 feet goes down the St. Mary's River, and that's, uh, um, that then flows into uh, Lake Huron. Lake Huron and Lake Michigan are essentially connected through the Straits of Mackinac. Their water levels are the exact same. That flows from Lake Huron into the St. Clair River, into Lake St. Clair, which really isn't even shown on here because it's so small. The Detroit River then flows from Lake St. Clair into Lake Erie, which is what we're talking about today. And water elevation on here shows 569 feet. Now that's low water. Really, today water level is 574 point something feet above sea level. And then Lake Erie, most of you guys know, it flows out through Buffalo or near Buffalo through the Niagara River over Niagara Falls into Lake Ontario, which sits much, much lower than Lake Erie does. And then out of Lake Ontario, you go through the St. Lawrence River into the Atlantic Ocean. The St. Lawrence River is essentially the outflow for all of the Great Lakes. And on an annual basis, the St. Lawrence River frequently has more water flowing out of it on an annual basis than the Mississippi River. This is a massive, massive amount of water flowing through this system. And because the Great Lakes flow, that, that creates some interesting dynamics uh, that we see in Lake Erie. So some of, uh, um, because of the way those Great Lakes flow and the size of those lakes, uh, we get different residence times. You know, we talked about this yesterday. Lake Superior, very, very, very big. And it takes for a drop of water that flows into Lake Superior, on average, you know, about 200 years or so for that, for each drop of water in Lake Superior to flow out Lake Superior into Lake Huron uh, and Lake Michigan. Now, Lake Michigan has a longer retention time than Lake Huron. Eh, don't worry about that. And then Lake Erie being so, so shallow, and that's essentially what this is showing. You know, the blue and the green are very deep. The red is very shallow water. Uh, Lake Erie, Lake Superior takes 200 years for that water to fully uh, um, leave that system. Lake Erie takes two, two and a half years. Very, very, very short in the, in the scale of uh, um, the Great Lakes. Lake Ontario is a little bit smaller by surface area, deeper than Lake Erie. It takes about six years for all that lake to, uh, to kind of refresh. And that's really important for uh, environmental challenges. So Lake Erie is essentially, I mean, the Great Lakes are, are, you know, the superlatives are always thrown out there about so much water. Well, Lake Erie is really, is, is different than all of the other ones. I don't want to say it's better, or worse or anything like that, but it's the smallest in terms of water volume. It's the warmest. In the summertime, I mean, it's 80 degrees out there off the lakeside right now. Uh, so it's by far the warmest of the Great Lakes. It's also the coldest of the Great Lakes. Uh, it's so shallow that during summertime, it warms up rapidly. During wintertime, it cools down fastest. So it's the one that is uh, most likely to freeze over, the first one to freeze over, even though it's the southernmost. Uh, it's also because of all of the flow coming in and everything, it ends up being the fishiest of the Great Lakes. Lake Erie has 2% of the water in the Great Lakes, but has 50% of the fish in all of the Great Lakes. They're all found here in Lake Erie really most of them centered around this Western Basin area. And that's, again, really important for, uh, because of all of these dynamics, important for the environmental uh, condition that we're in today. Also, you know, again, this stuff we talked about more yesterday, but Lake Erie really shaped Ohio in a lot of ways. And if you look up here on uh, the map on the left, hopefully you guys can all see my cursor and it's not too uh, slow and glitchy. 
this area, this map, essentially, it's showing just a topographical, it's topography, it's a relief map of the state of Ohio. Now, obviously, the highest point here is like, what, 1,000 foot, 1,500 feet above sea level. Lake Erie's 574 feet above sea level. You know, th these are not, this is not the Rocky Mountains, but when you think about it in terms of the topography, this area is excessively, uh, excessively, excessively flat. You know, Lakeside being here, this is Marblehead Peninsula, Catawba Island, all the island. West of here, this being the Maumee River that you can see, exceptionally flat. And that's essentially because at one point during that Lake Maumee stage, this was all underwater. This was the bottom of Lake Maumee. And what happens when you have your underwater? Generally speaking, wave energy flattens everything out. It planes the bottom of it. And that's why we're left with the dense clay soils that we have in this region, uh, as well as the really low line topographical relief. Historically, before Europeans came in and kind of altered this system, we had the Great Black Swamp that occupied the majority of this, what's shown in green on here. Uh, it was all wetland. And that was really important for what we're doing. So one of the things, um, one other background thing, I was gonna talk about this at the end, but I wanted to throw this out there at the beginning because climate change is really important. We always talk of, you know, a, a lot of people that aren't in the sciences, they, I think they tend to get burned out with the idea. And um, there's this sentiment that, you know, scientists point at that as that, oh, that's the cause of all of our ills and everything. Um, but it's really important to understand that, you know, Ohio is Ohio because of our climate. If we had wetter, a wetter climate or a drier climate or a colder climate or a warmer climate, our entire ecosystems here would be dramatically different. It's impossible to overstate the impact that our climate has on our lake and our you know, upstream habitats or upland habitat. Everything is driven by our climate. And so if there are changes to that, that is, those implications and changes are gonna be seen throughout absolutely everything that we have here. So I wanted to throw that out there. So there's two things, two big changes that we're seeing in Ohio and two projections of what we're likely to see. And uh, I also will say in advance that I apologize if any of you helped put some of these information or some of this content together. I apologize for blatantly ripping it off of partners and folks like that. Uh, two things that we're seeing with Ohio in terms of our climate. Um, one being temperature changes. So uh, a lot of the projections are you know, we're seeing differences in our summer and winter climates in terms of temperatures. And one of the things we're seeing in our summer is that our climate is essentially shifting from the baseline. I don't know what baseline is, I guess before 2000 or so, what most of us grew up with. Uh, it's essentially shifting west and south. So by the year 2030, the current projections are that our climate in say Northern Ohio, where we are today, will be similar to central uh, um, Illinois. And really, we're already seeing a lot of that. And a lot of you that have been coming up here to Lakeside for a lot of years, especially if you've been here in the uh, um, wintertime, you, you'll, you've seen those sorts of changes where summertime, we're experiencing that. Wintertime, our climate really nowadays is like Southern Ohio, if not West Virginia, in terms of our winter climate. By the end of this century, uh, I probably won't be around here, but my son very well might. The climate there, it's going to be like Arkansas here. Uh, and wintertime climate is going to be more like, you know, Eastern Virginia. It's a very, very, very different ecosystem there. Very different weather patterns. You know, all sorts of changes are going to be occurring with that. One of the other things that we're seeing, one of the starkest changes that we're seeing is in terms of changes in our precipitation. And one of the biggest things that we're seeing is we're seeing in the entire U Eastern United States, especially uh, especially when we get in northeastern U.S., we're seeing dramatic increases in heavy precipitation. You know, we don't get the rainy days like we used to. Uh, when I was a kid, it would rain, we'd get an inch of rain, two inches of rain over a day or two days. We don't get that in the spring anymore. Now our weather patterns are, you know, pretty common to what we've had the last week or so, where we get a downpour and we get two inches of rain in one rain event. And then we have, a, a you know, no rain and essentially a drought. And again, that dramatically changes everything. It's not that we're seeing substantial increases in our precipitation, although we are, we're seeing maybe about 10% more on average per year, more precipitation falling. The biggest change we're seeing is how that precipitation is falling. And that's essentially what this is showing that 
more and more of our precipitation is coming in those big events as opposed to uh, um, more steady events. So that's kind of enough about a uh, um, kind of climate change and background. So let's start diving into some of these environmental issues and challenges that we're seeing. Um, the biggest one, this is on everyone's mind this year and last year, water levels. Uh, obviously it's pretty high. Uh, if most of you have been going to Lakeside for the past, you know, decades or even five years or so, you've seen big changes in our water levels. So what's, what's going on with that? Well, like I said before, our water levels have always fluctuated and they always will fluctuate. So what this chart is essentially showing is going back to the end of the ice age, you know, 14,000 years ago, here's what Lake Erie has done or their former iterations of Lake Erie. Water level is essentially shown here on the, um, on the y-axis. And you'll see that we had a lot of dramatic changes uh, where it's, you know, the high was about 800 foot above sea level. The low during the Ypsilanti water stage actually occurred when, Lake, when the Detroit River was no longer flowing into Lake Erie. And it, essentially there was, you know, a small lake that basically a lot of the uh, um, Lake Erie watershed uh, tributaries essentially flowed into the eastern basin of Lake Erie and that's why it was so low. Anyway, a bunch of changes have occurred due to isostatic rebound after the glaciers and all sorts of stuff. Um, but generally speaking, we've kind of stabilized over the past, say, you know, five, 10,000 years or so. And it has fluctuated. It's kind of risen. Most of this rise that we've seen in the last 5,000 years, 10,000 years, most of that is really driven by isostatic rebound. What I mean by that is uh, we had two miles of ice in these glaciers and that's a lot of weight to push down on the Earth's crust. When those glaciers were gone, now that two miles of ice is no longer there. The crust actually rises back up when that pressure isn't there. And that really drove a lot of this change, this, this increase. So this shows years before present. Today, we are basically where the blue line is. What's going to happen in the future? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Is it going to stabilize? I, who knows? Uh, that, there's a, that's a really good question. But odds are it's probably going to be relatively similar. We're unlikely to see these big changes with one massive, massive exception. About 20,000 years or so from now, Niagara Falls is slowly eating away the Niagara River. It's migrating up, upstream and it's got its eyes on Lake Erie. As soon as Niagara Falls breaches the end of the, the Niagara River where Lake Erie flows into it, all of a sudden uh, there will be no lake anymore. Uh, Lake Erie will catastrophically drain and it will cease to exist. Uh, and this is kind of what the lake looks like today in terms of the symmetry. And again, the, the red and the orange is shallow, the blue is deep. This is what it looks like today. 90% of the water comes from the Detroit River here. Another 5% or so of it comes here, totaling, you know, maybe 95% of the water flows into the Western Basin that flows into Lake Erie. All of that flows this direction. Eventually, when Niagara Falls eats its way through and breaches Lake Erie, we will essentially have a river. The, the Detroit River, the Maumee River, they will combine forces with some other ones. And we will have some sort of river channel that flows all the way through the lake. And there may be a little bit of a lake left here in the Eastern Basin. Um, but Lake Erie, as we know it today, will cease to exist. So more recently, you know, water level has fluctuated and it does fluctuate rapidly. This is essentially a chart going back to 1860. And we've had low water periods, the worst of which, or the, the lowest of which was during the Dust Bowl era in the 1930s, at least that we've recorded going back to the 1860s, we've got good records. During these low water periods in the mid 60s and the 30s, you know, this is a picture of East Harbor State Park's beach. There was a lot of beach there. Uh, this is essentially what it looks like under high water periods, like today. There isn't an awful lot out there. Uh, the water is simply higher. Today, like I said before, water sits about 574 and a quarter or so feet, um, which is essentially what's shown here. Uh, the lowest we've seen was about 568 feet. So that's, what's that, six feet lower than we have today. Um, that's a lot of water. That's a lot. That's a very big difference. And again, why does it fluctuate? Well, because the Great Lakes are essentially a riverine system. And Lake Erie water levels are essentially, there's this tug in, this constant battle between water inputs and water uh, exports. And which of those wins out, is, it's a good question. So things that are helping to increase water in the lake, precipitation, the wetter the storm, uh, 
the more precipitation we have, not only in Lake Erie, but in the upper Great Lakes, because again, 90% of our water comes through the Detroit River from the upper Great Lakes. More precipitation leads to higher water levels. More ice coverage also leads to higher water levels. And the reason for that is there's a lot of evaporation that occurs on the lake. So all of the, uh, um, all the lake effect snow that we see on the eastern base of Lake Erie, over in uh, you know, northeastern Ohio and Buffalo Erie, Pennsylvania, those kind of areas, that's essentially caused by evaporating warm water from Lake Erie. So when the air is cold, you get all this steam rises, it rises up, and then as soon as you get to the, to the land, which generally is colder, that water vapor condenses, cools, uh, and comes out, of, uh, um, comes out of solution and basically falls as precipitation, and, you know, as snow. When the lake is iced over, it doesn't evaporate. I mean, a tiny bit sublimes off of the surface of it, but virtually nothing. So the more ice cover we have, the higher our water levels are because we don't have that evaporation. On the flip side, evaporation is a way, one way we lose a tremendous amount of water. Evaporation and evapotranspiration. That's the term that we'll kind of define in a minute. Also, the big one is the Niagara River. Most of our water flows out of that. And these changes are constantly, you know, one of them is going to win out under higher water periods like we have now in the last couple of years. You know, we've had more precipitation. We've had more water coming in than we've had going out. So our water level rises. One of the big things that we're uh, seeing in terms of changes too is um, the amount of water that falls onto the, uh, um, onto the watershed. We're seeing more and more of that water end up in the lake. A higher percentage of that water is ending up in the lake than has historically. So we talked about that great black swamp, right? In Northwestern Ohio. Now again, the Maumee Rivers, or I'm sorry, the Detroit River, you know, the upper Great Lakes contribute about 90% of the water into Lake Erie. Maumee River and the other tributaries here are say, you know, make up the other 10%. Um, the Maumee River being the biggest one. Maumee River generally was this great black swamp area. And this is what it used to look like. It was essentially a flooded forest. And, you know, we fixed that back in the, around the turn of the century. Um, now, when we had a lot of forest out there and a lot of that wetland forest, that water would be moving very slow. When we'd have rain, it would fall in that landscape and it would very, very, very slowly percolate from up in the watershed, up in, the, um, up in that wetland area, very slowly move its way back to Lake Erie or down to Lake Erie. Uh, the Amazon rainforest, the reason there's so much rain in the rainforest is because all of that evapotranspiration. So what do plants do? Plants essentially pull water out of the ground and they release them out through the leaves of the plant. And we see the same thing in rainforest. And all of that, that moisture, that evapotranspiration that's coming out of those plants, that's really what drives all of that rain in the rainforest. So a, a tremendous amount of water is uptaken by plants and released into the atmosphere. Well, when you no longer have those plants that are there, you don't have the, the level of evapotranspiration, combine that with all of the ditches and the, the um, water management infrastructure that we changed in the Western Basin of Lake Erie, especially in our, agricultural, in our agricultural areas, and far, far more of that water that falls on the landscape ends up in the lake than it used to. So, you know, that's having an impact on, on our water levels today. So what about climate change? We talked a little bit about that. Well, we are seeing increased precipitation, you know, about 10% or more a year. It really varies on, on a, an annual basis, but uh, on average, about 10% more we're seeing per year. We've seen more precipitation. Um, we're also seeing more temperatures though, which is less ice and more evaporation. The truth is we really don't know what's gonna happen in the future uh, in Lake Erie or the other Great Lakes for that matter. Um, we're seeing those two impacts, uh, those two big impacts from climate change are, you know, essentially, they're increasing that tug of war battle. Um, some scientists think, well, it, it's likely that the, um, that the decrease in ice coverage and the warmer temperatures, that's going to over, uh, that's going to kind of outcompete, if you will, increases in precipitation. Um, and then there's others that are saying, we really don't know. So, no idea what's going to happen in the, in the future. Uh, the only thing that we know is that, you know, th these sort of, uh, this battle is likely to be continue to get more and more severe as time goes on. So the other takeaway, water always wins. Uh, when you have land and you have water, water is always going to win. 
Uh, and this is going to be really important as we dive into this next kind of topic, which is really focusing on um, kind of shoreline erosion and the impacts of high water level. So uh, one of the things partially based on the feedback from yesterday is uh, I wanted to do a bit of a deep dive on Lake Erie shoreline erosion, but I also wanted to focus it on Lake Erie's waterfront because that's something all of you guys have probably seen before. So let's talk about Lake Erie, lakeside shoreline erosion, and we're gonna kind of do a deep dive on that and the, what you learn through that, hopefully you'll be able to apply those lessons to other areas that are seeing similar erosion. Generally speaking, it's complicated. People pointed that out before. So how did our shorelines form? All of this is really important to understanding why the great, why Lake Erie shoreline looks the way it does. And this is essentially a, a map of a very poorly drawn one. Uh, I apologize. Um, it's Google Earth snapshot. And what these yellow lines and arrows are showing is essentially movement of littoral sediment. What I mean by littoral sediment is uh, the littoral zone is essentially the shallow water zone of like a big lake. So sand movement, uh, that's essentially what this is showing. And um, Lakeside, again, being right here, you can see the Marblehead Quarry really well. For those of you coming from uh, south and eastern Ohio, northeastern Ohio, Sandusky Bay Bridge is right here. So um, one of the things that you see is sand moves different directions along our shorelines. Uh, Locust Point, Davis Best Nuclear Power Plant is right here. This area is essentially called Locust Point. North and west of Locust Point, this is the McGee Marsh Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge Complex shown on this image. Um, Sand generally moves from east to west from that point. Now, when we go to the east side of that, sand moves from west to east along the shoreline. This is Catawba Island. From Catawba Island, it moves from north to south. And this being East Harbor State Park, again, sand is moving from north to south here. And from the tip of Marblehead around Lakeside, it generally moves from east to west. Um, going out towards the lighthouse and around the point, generally moves, oops, generally moves from north to south, and then coming up by Cedar Point, this is a Cedar Point in Sandusky, moves east to west. So one of the things that you get in these areas where you have these converging uh, currents of littoral sediment, of sand movement, beaches form. Port Clinton City Beach is right here at the convergence of these points. Lake or, uh, East Harbor State Park was formed by the convergence of these. Right here, Cedar Point, a lot of sand out there. Um, Bay Point too, sandbar. There were times in his historical records where these were essentially connected and people could walk across or you know carry cattle and stuff across from Marblehead to Sandusky that way. And that's really, really important for our shoreline. So what happens when we start altering our shoreline is really, really important. So this is an image. I know someone yesterday asked a question about uh, salt mines, which made me think they're maybe from uh, that kind of Menor region. So this is essentially Menor Headlands, uh, state nature preserve or state park and one thing that you see is in this area sand movement being indicated by the yellow uh, arrow moves from west to east there's a big really big break wall here that's kind of hard to see but it runs up this way and then it also runs this way when sand hits a break wall like that a, a hardened structure an anthropogenic structure that humans created in this case to protect the river outlet and to provide a navigational channel that sand that would ordinarily continue flowing east stops and it no longer can go beyond that. So in those cases, you get sand building up. And on the, down, on the flip side, on the downstream side of this, this area is scouring. There's no beach left. Historically, there would have been. Uh, so these sort of structures, as soon as we start changing things, um, and, and that's essentially what you see with the blue arrows is you see the shoreline growing in this case and over here it's eroding uh, because of that loss of near shore sediment and the disruption of that littoral sediment chain. So on a more local level, what happens? Uh, well, again, I pointed this out before, um, starting to zoom into Lakeside from Catawba Island, it goes south and from um, Marblehead, it, it moves west. Now along here, you saw what happened at Menor. Yeah, you're also, a lot of you are probably familiar with the Lakeside Dock. That's a big structure that's out there. There's a lot of other jetties and things like that that have disrupted those near shore sediment transport chains and you can see them here. This is a Lakeside Dock. Uh, this is a loading dock for the quarry. And there's, there's a lot of anthropogenic structures and changes to our shoreline that have occurred. 
you know, all of them shown on here. Here's more of a zoomed in image of Lakeside's shoreline, especially the dock area. And one of the things that, that we see in terms of sand movement is when we add those structures, we change how that sand moves along our shorelines. And one of the things that, you know, we, we've essentially seen after they've constructed the Lakeside dock, now our sand moves back and forth. It's not a continuous one-way flow one way or another. In this location, if you get a storm out of the Northeast, it'll generally move from East to West. You get strong Northwest winds, it can move that sand the other direction. And that's kind of shown on here, these arrows going back and forth. Now, one thing with the, the dock structure, the way it's placed, sand that does move through here, and I realize that the, there's a little bit of a cut right through here. Um, it generally does move, but the sand that the sand grain that ends up here on the beach, protected from a lot of shore, uh, from a lot of waves and things, doesn't really move. It's essentially lost. It is no longer in that littoral sediment transport chain, and this beach is building up right here at Lakeside. The downside is where did that sand come from that has built up here? Well, it's come from here. So uh, there's some trade-offs there, right? Um, I really like this image, and this is one of the, um, this is essentially a, a Google Earth image from, uh, what is it, August 31st, 2019, or I'm sorry, 2009. And I use this image, it isn't the clearest one, but it shows something really, really, really interesting. It's a really important factor in uh, understanding how changes to our shoreline affect uh, all of these factors. So you can see on this image, there must have been a Northwest wind. You can kind of see, let me go back. You can see these waves that are coming from the Northwest, right? And I've kind of, you can see the arrow uh, pointing the direction of the wind and the waves, and you can kind of see them. Uh, running, you know, basically being pushed by the, uh, um, by the winds. The other thing you see on this image, and it's not very common to get good images like this to show this, you see these other waves that are forming. Now, these are not going the same direction. Uh, let, me, let me go back uh, to where it's a clear image. You can essentially see those waves that are being deflected by these structures. You see them off the dock right here, and you see them off of Lakeside Marina that's over here. And what's happening is increasing waves. Now, what you don't see, although it happens frequently in this image, is all of that rock that's been placed along here. That rock isn't natural. That rock was never placed there to begin with. So you get that same dynamic from all of those rocks that were placed there of wave energies being deflected out. So you guys have all been to a beach before and you see a wave break on the beach. And what happens? It breaks on the beach and it moves sand grains around and that wave energy is dissipated. It's essentially absorbed by the beach, by those sand grains that are there. When you have rock on a, on a shoreline, you go down to the lighthouse someday and you'll see those waves, they're not absorbed by the shoreline. They're deflected by that shoreline and pushed back out. And that's one of the reasons why so many people have the, post those cool pictures of the big wave events and stuff on the dock. When those waves, they hit and they pile way up high because all that wave energy, it's not absorbed, it's deflected. And what happens when those waves are deflected? It pushes not only water, it carries sand and sediment with it. So all of those factors combined with the sand that used to be along here, that's kind of been trapped within here, the main sediment transport chains that generally speaking have no longer are occurring because of the changes to our shoreline have kind of led us to where we are today in terms of, um, the erosion that we see, which is the green arrow. And it's basically the land that is being eroded by the shoreline because essentially those waves are breaking now, not farther offshore like they used to historically, but especially combined with high water levels, they're breaking on the shoreline. They are eroding that shoreline that's just behind those rocks. And that's essentially what's happening today at Lakeside. So shoreline hardening, all of the rock that's been placed there combined with the high water levels that we're seeing, the loss of nearshore sediment, all of that leads to that increased erosion that we are seeing at Lakeside today. And not just Lakeside, we're seeing this all over the Great Lakes and especially Lake Erie, uh, given the high water levels that we're seeing. What's gonna happen in the future in terms of water levels? I don't know, but you could easily, there's no reason that Lake Erie couldn't be a foot higher, two foot higher in the future. Uh, if we continue to have wet years like we had last year, um, we'll see. Who knows what's, what's in store for us? So then the big question is, okay, so 
This is complicated. How do we fix it? Um, that depends what you consider a fix. You know, when you think about what I mentioned before, water always wins on shorelines. Generally speaking, our shorelines erode. That's a natural process. The sand that's in those littoral sediment transport chains that formed our beaches essentially were placed there when our shoreline eroded. And what happened is the small, you know, soil is made up of a bunch of things, you know, between little rocks and sand grains, which are big, silt and clay particles are really, really, really tiny. Those silt and clay particles generally stay in the water column longer, they float out and they settle in the middle of the lake. Uh, the sand sticks around. And that sand that is currently on our beaches formed because of the wave, because of erosion on our shorelines. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the shoreline erosion isn't great, but having the beach, yeah, that's great, we love that. So in terms of what do we fix it? I, that's, that's a complicated thing. If we had lower water levels, we wouldn't have the wave energy hitting the shoreline. So we wouldn't have the erosion that we see now. Uh, if we had less storm events, and again, that's one of those climate change impacts, right? We're seeing more increasingly severe storm events uh, with, a more, um, with an increasing likelihood that they're gonna happen on an annual basis because erosion doesn't happen a little bit at a time, right? We get one storm, and that's when all of that erosion, that big event happens all at once. And that's something that we are seeing over time becoming increasingly severe. Could we put more rock out there? Is there? Yeah, we could. I mean, if we can cause those waves to break farther offshore or to keep those waves from hitting that soft, like where the grass is right now that's eroding away, that would essentially prevent the erosion. Comes with some trade-offs. Could you put a beach there? I'm sure if you put enough sand there, you, you could do that. Where are you gonna get the money to do that sort of thing? Um, there would be trade-offs with those sorts of things as well, right? All of this stuff comes with trade-offs. What, what would the cost be? Uh, there is a, when we talk um, sea level rise, when I work with my colleagues on the ocean coast, when they talk about climate change and sea level rise migrating inland, uh, one of the solutions there um, in a lot of places, it makes a lot of sense, is, you know, the only real good solution is a retreat. And, you know, in some places that makes the most sense. Uh, I'm not saying that's what should happen here. Um, I'm not encouraging any sort of change. I'm, I'm just trying to point out to you why these sorts of things are happening and, and how could this change in the future. So I'm going to grab a quick drink of water. Uh, I will be right back. And Dakota said that during this, she, I think she was going to sing the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, right? <laughs> Oh, putting me on the spot there. Okay, well, um, give me just 30 seconds, I'll be right back. All right. Um, so in this time yesterday, we did take some more questions, but what we're gonna try to do is, if you do have questions, please feel free to submit them now, um, but we will be waiting still till the end of the program to go through and ask him those. We wanna give Matt a good chance to, to um, get all of his program across. We had so many come in yesterday. So if you do have any questions, we'd love to take that, but we're gonna wait still till the end um, so that we can keep keep going on the program. So, so you're not gonna sing, Dakota? I'm not gonna sing. I think everyone would leave and never come back if I would start singing. All right, well, we'll uh, I guess we'll continue going. Um, so, we, so we're about halfway through this, uh, about 45 minutes or so we've taken. Um, the next thing, and I'm hoping that we can get through all of this and we still have some time at the end for questions. Um, another big issue, environmental challenge, an issue that we're seeing in, in Lake Erie is invasive species. So why are invasive species such an issue? Well, uh, Lake Erie's food web, like any food web, is very, very complex, right? The way this works is you start with plants and algae. Those plants and algae are eaten by you know, invertebrates, generally speaking, and then, you know, like zooplankton or, you know, mayflies, things like that, that are eaten then by small fish, which are eaten by bigger fish. And it's really complicated. And as soon as you throw in an invasive species, such as these, uh, some of them we may not call them invasive species, but rainbow trout, steelhead, are essentially a non-native species. As soon as you throw something into that mix, um, you're throwing a wrench into this really complicated system, and we don't really know what the impacts are gonna be. Uh, any new thing that comes in here is taking resources and food from other stuff that already exists here. And it's going to cause a lot of changes. Um, zebra mussels have had profound changes on Lake Erie's ecosystem. Um, and like always, there, you know, there's those sort of trade-offs with it. 
The biggest thing to remember about invasive species is they alter food webs. Whether it's good or bad really depends upon your perspective. Uh, the biggest thing to know though, is it's a change and we're never really gonna be able to predict all of the impacts. One of the impacts that we're seeing right now that we really didn't necessarily foresee, or scientists didn't really foresee, is spiny water flea. Uh, and they're essentially shown here on the right in this little vial of uh, water. If, you, if any of you troll for walleye, um, I'm sure you have seen the spiny water fleas, you know, basically uh, accumulated at the end of your line right before your swivel or your uh, um, rigs, um, because they're, they're occupying, let me go back, they're occupying this niche right here at the zooplankton and a lot of things are feeding on them, including yellow perch. So one of the things that we're seeing with this, one of the trade-offs, right? Because it, is it good, is it bad? I, that's, that's a philosophical discussion for someone else to have. One of the things that we're seeing with yellow perch and spiny water fleas are yellow perch dietary changes in, in Lake Erie. Western Basin, the, the walleye perch fishery, the recreational fishery has kind of been in the tank the last few years, if any of you fish. One of the biggest reasons, it's not because perch populations are down. They really aren't. Perch populations are really pretty good in, in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. One of the biggest things that we're seeing, and if you fish, next time you catch some uh, perch, you know, check their stomach out when you're cleaning them, assuming you clean them. And one thing a lot of us are seeing is their stomachs are increasingly full of spiny water fleas. I was out uh, scuba diving with my wife just, uh, what was it, about a week ago. And uh, off of the east side of Kelly's, there's a shipwreck. And there are just clouds and clouds of spiny water fleas. And you can see them in the water. And what shrimp or uh, um, what we're seeing with yellow perch is they're shifting their dietary preferences from fish over to things like spiny water fleas. And that's, their growth rates are going really, really good. Their population's going really good. The downside to all of that is they're much harder to catch because they're not eating minnows like they used to. What's going to happen with Asian carp? That's kind of the, the, um, the gorilla that's out there, right? Is what kind of impact are Asian carp going to have on Lake Erie's food web? Uh, they've had dramatic changes to, uh, um, to the Mississippi River because when they came in, they, uh, you know, they essentially occupy this niche of, of eating, you know, kind of this intermediate niche. They're eating a lot of zooplankton and, and smaller stuff to the point of, keeping the other, they're keeping food from all these other fish species. So we're seeing collapses of a lot of these other native fish species in other areas where these, especially the big head and the silver carp that are filter feeders, we're seeing the collapse of a lot of other fisheries. If they get into the Great Lakes, it's entirely possible that they're gonna cause a collapse in a lot of our fisheries, you know, the perch and walleye fisheries. Do we know that for sure? No, we really don't. Um, there may be good impacts from it. I, they're, they're, I, it just depends what you see, you know, there is no good or bad. It, it, it would be a dramatic change. And if you like the walleye fish, that change would probably not be seen as a good thing. But again, there, there may very well be trade-offs with that. We just don't know what all of those are. There's no way we can predict it uh, unless they get in here. We really don't want to find out. So we talked about invasive species. Uh, we talked about water levels. One of the next big things we wanted to, I wanted to talk about is harmful algal blooms. And again, I'm hoping that I can have, leave enough time for some questions here. So Lake Erie is a walleye capital of the world. Uh, in terms of the number of fish caught and the pounds of walleye caught, no other uh, fishery in the world has the, the level of uh, walleye fishery that, that Lake Erie has. The reason it has that is because it's so fertile. There are enough, there's so many nutrients that are out there. There's a lot of food, the habitat's good for those fish. But, move this around, too much of a good thing. Again, comes with trade-offs, right? Uh, eutrophication, that's a term that I'm gonna introduce to you guys. It's essentially when you have too many nutrients in a water body. So what happens, nutrients are great for growing plants, but too many nutrients, especially out in the lake, they're not, they're no longer growing beneficial algae that are food for things. They can grow negative algae and, and things that are causing harmful algal blooms and blue green algae, stuff like that. You know, all of these issues are things that, you know, we could take a week or a month talking about any of these individual issues that I'm kind of going over today, um, really skimming over it. But two issues, if we have too much nutrients, that's 
uh, generally seen as a bad thing. And there's really two big issues associated with that eutrophication. One thing to note in here, the causes of these two issues, both the central basin hypoxic zone and the harmful algal blooms we're seeing, the causes are the same and the solutions are also the same. So a little bit about Lake Erie, right? Yeah, um, I think I showed you guys this before. We have three distinct basins in Lake Erie. You know, the Detroit River comes in here. The Western Basin is here. Marblehead Peninsula, Lakeside's right here. Western Basin is very shallow. There's th these kind of two different island archipelagos, right? The Bass Island one, and then that kind of Peely Kelly's Island one. Um, and then when you start moving east into the central basin, and uh, for scale size, this uh, dotted line here, that's a dividing line between Ohio and Pennsylvania. And this is the line uh, between Pennsylvania and New York. Central basin of Lake Erie is by far the biggest in terms of surface area. It occupies, I don't know, two thirds, half to two thirds of the lake uh, in terms of surface area. And it's deeper than the Western Basin. The Western Basin average water level, oh, I can't remember, something like 20, 25 feet, something like that. Central Basin is more like 60 feet. So it's deeper than the Western Basin. Uh, it's larger than the Western Basin. We don't have the amount of water flowing into it like we have the Western Basin. Western Basin, the vast majority of the water, about 95% of the water coming into Lake Erie flows into the Western Basin. Um, then we go farther east, and we're not really gonna be talking about um, the issues farther east, although we do certainly have some uh, issues of like Caladophora and things like that that are essentially a type of harmful algal bloom. Very deep, the water quality out here, or water clarity is very, very good. It's much colder, uh, very few nutrients compared to over here. And the, this kind of geological conformation of the lake has a lot of impacts on these sorts of issues. Residence time, right? We talked about that. How long does it take a drop of water entering Lake Erie? for that drop of water to leave. On average, it's about two years, uh, two, two and a half years for that water, all of the water in Lake Erie to be flushed out of Lake Erie. The Western Basin, because the vast majority of the water comes into here, uh, but it's very shallow. Uh, really, we're talking a few weeks, maybe. It, it really depends on how much flow is coming in, but we're talking weeks, you know, to a month or so. So water is moving through the Western Basin really quite rapidly compared to the Central Basin. So water's flowing through here rapidly and it gets into that big Central Basin and it slows down and it takes it much, much, much longer for that water to move through there. And that's really, really important because one of the things that we see, you know, the Western Basin is really where most of our uh, fish and most of our, um, phytoplankton, the algae, and the food web. Most of that productivity in the lake, that, that uh, um, the life in Lake Erie, is in the western basin of Lake Erie. So the water in the western basin is much greener. There's much more algae to it. And algae isn't a bad thing. It's, you know, that's good. It's the base of the food web. As that algae moves into the central basin, a lot of that algae then has the opportunity, it settles down. We don't have the nutrients flowing into the central basin like we do the western basin. Uh, those nutrients or the, the algae, you know, combined with fish and other things, when it dies, it sinks and it settles down to the bottom, oops, to the bottom of the lake. And when that settles down, bacteria are, bacteria decompose anything, whether it's, you know, a squirrel that got hit by a car or it's algae that's at the bottom of the lake. Bacteria are decomposing that. And what they do, they use oxygen in the process of decomposition. And Frequently what happens in the central basin, because it's in this kind of bad Goldilocks zone where it's too deep for waves to fully stir it up like we see in the western basin, right, where it's much shallower, waves will stir it up and water and uh, um, oxygen can defer or uh, um, dissolve into the water column and kind of mix throughout the water column. Central basin doesn't have that. It's just too deep for, for waves to stir it up and for oxygen to penetrate down through it, but it's also too shallow for dilution to occur with the amount of nutrients coming in. So we kind of get this, this downside of hypoxic zone where it's essentially caused by too much productivity. And one of the things that you see here, let me move my image out of the way, is you know the, um, this is essentially showing dissolved oxygen, red being good, high dissolved oxygen is a good thing. And what we see is springtime, early springtime, mid springtime, a lot of oxygen throughout the lake, and then as we get into mid late summer and especially into late summer and getting into fall, uh, you know, all that algae that's kind of settled here combined with warmer water, warm water holds less oxygen than cold water does. Uh, 
you get these anoxic zones developing where you have all the oxygen or the majority of the oxygen being eaten up by the uh, bacteria that are there causing essentially hypoxic zones. Now, usually those are down deep in the water column, but because of the currents and wave energies and things like that, you can have upwelling events where that anoxic water can essentially, you know, upwell up into the surface water and you can have fish kills and things like that from it. And that's essentially caused by excess nutrients. Um, and like I said, you know, the causes and the uh, solutions are the same thing. The other big one, you know, <laughs> this is kind of the, um, uh, the, I would say that, you know, unquestionably the biggest algal bloom or the biggest environmental challenge Lake Erie faces today is, is algal blooms. Um, and we had algal blooms back in the past, you know, in the 1970s, late, late 60s, 70s, we had algal blooms. Um, we have them again today. And, you know, it kind of uh, um, uh, culminated in 2014 when we had the Toledo water crisis where about half a million people couldn't drink their water for three days. Uh, that was kind of a big wake up call to a lot of people. The general cause for all of these is excess nutrients, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. In the 1970s, most of our algal blooms were caused by point sources of pollution. What I mean by that is um, pollution coming out of a pipe. We talked yesterday about this more, and it was the same sort of issue that caused the uh, um, Cuyahoga River when it caught on fire. Um, we had all of this pollution, generally speaking, coming out of a point, which was the end of a pipe, because those sorts of uh, pipes and effluent discharges really weren't regulated and there was no reason they had to be clean. So in response to those sorts of things, uh, uh, the federal government passed the Clean Water Act, which essentially mandated you know, better wastewater treatment. That was the cause of our algal blooms back then and the excess nutrients that were running off into the lake. When we regulated that, that was relatively easy to fix because we could point directly at those pipes and say, hey, these pipes are the reason that this is an issue, but we can address that. Now, today, today's algal blooms are a little bit different. Um, it's still being caused by the same sort of algal uh, species. It's still being caused by excess nutrients. It's still being caused by excess phosphorus. Um, but the cause, when we get to like the root cause, it is a little bit different. Today's algal blooms are caused by non-point sources of pollution, and these are massive. So this is an image from October 2011. So 2014 is when the Toledo water crisis was. That algal bloom really wasn't the biggest one on record. It really wasn't even close to it. But it just happened to be one that settled in a really bad location. You could see how these algal blooms moved. Uh, in 2011, this is Cleveland for scale. Um, it migrated all the way out towards the uh, Pennsylvania border in 2011. So what do I mean by non-point sources of pollution? I'm, I apologize for the really miserable uh, um, uh, amateur type of uh, image, but it was the easiest one to grab. So non-point sources of pollution are generally things that aren't coming out of a pipe. Uh, when we, it, It's hard to pinpoint exactly where it is. So in terms of non-point source pollution, if, if we cut down forests, we generally get more erosion and you know, we get more uh, sediment flowing out of that, right? Because the trees aren't holding the soil in, they're not absorbing the water. Um, it's a source of non-point source pollution. We know it's not coming from a pipe, it's coming from a big area. Same thing with uh, agricultural development. Um, when they talk about rural homes, generally what they're referring to are things like uh, um, uh, uh, septic systems and things like that, where we don't have the, the kind of infrastructure for you know, wastewater treatment plants and sanitary sewer systems. Um, development, suburban development, runoff from city streets, parking lots, all of that sort of stuff. Those are all types of non-point source pollution because there isn't a specific point that we can, there isn't the end of a pipe that we can point to and say, this is where that, that problem's coming from. When we talk about Lake Erie's algal bloom today, we're really talking about primarily things that are coming from agricultural development. There are, all of these are impacts, not really the forestry, or the uh, um, air pollution, um, those really aren't contributing to our algal blooms. All of these other ones are. But when we talk about the amount, over 70% of our phosphorus and, and our algal blooms are essentially driven by excess phosphorus. That's the, the limiting nutrient. Again, it's more complicated than that, but generally speaking, phosphorus is the problem that we need to address. 
Over 70% of the phosphorus, generally speaking nowadays, coming into Lake Erie is coming from agricultural fertilizers. And that's both a combination of synthetic fertilizers and manure uh, that are being spread. Most of that being located in the Maumee River watershed. So um, basically Northwestern Ohio, that great black swamp region, that's where the majority of this is coming from. Now, at the same time, 80 to 90% of the phosphorus coming into the lake is coming in during the biggest precipitation events. That's really, really, really important because what are we seeing with climate change? We're already seeing warmer temperatures and we're already seeing increased precipitation. When we start these modern day algal blooms, they really didn't start occurring until, you know, say the mid 2000s or so. And is this because farmers are doing worse than, you know, what's the difference between, say, a good year? Um, like 2005 and a bad year, like 2011. Did farmers, so, oh, sorry, let me, let me take a step back. This chart is basically showing the severity of our algal blooms. Uh, it's generally speaking, they have it on a scale of one to 10. They set that scale of one to 10 after the 2011 algal bloom. And then in 2015, we actually had one that exceeded the scale uh, because it was so bad. Um, and this is kind of, you know, basically what is the size of it in terms of um, square miles or so is essentially what this is showing. 10 being bad, zero being you know, no algal bloom whatsoever. So the difference between, say, 2005 and 2011, you know, where this was maybe like a one and this was a 10. Is it because farmers put 10, 10 times more fertilizers on their fields that year? No, of course not. It's driven by increased precipitation. Our algal blooms are, yes, the nutrients are coming from uh, farm fields. It, it, it's abs it absolutely is, the science is, is clear about that. But it's also the runoff of those farm fields. The nutrients aren't the problem when they stay on the farm fields. It's when they run off of that, that it becomes a problem. And really today our algal blooms are really driven by those changes that we're seeing in our precipitation patterns. So is it right to point fingers at farmers for this? Well, kind of. I mean, it is coming from their farm fields, but Mother Nature isn't cooperating anymore. That's why we're seeing these big variations. This year is supposed is going to be lower than last year was. Last year wasn't quite so bad, but that was there. There's a whole series of other issues about that. Um, this year we had a relatively dry spring. Um, we we're almost under drought conditions for a good portion of northwestern Ohio, but we're still forecasted to have a pretty bad algal bloom because the way that precipitation is falling is dramatically different than how it used to. So, you know, our algal blooms really are a, a climate change phenomenon. So how do we fix it? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, there's kind of two solutions that us and a lot of other people are working to do. And one is we want the fertilizers and, and farmers want the same thing, right? It's expensive to fertilize crops and things like that. We want to make sure that the fertilizers and the nutrients that are placed on farm fields, that they grow crops. We don't want those to grow algae. So how do we keep the nutrients on the farm field? Well, the, um, there's a bunch of different ways and a bunch of uh, management practices that farmers can use. I am not a farmer. Uh, I, I do not work um, in our agricultural program. We have a bunch of people at the Nature Conservancy that do do that work. So I hope I'm, I'm doing this work justice, but uh, you know, they, would, they understand this stuff so much more than I do. Um, one of the things that the Nature Conservancy and a lot of other partners uh, did is develop this 4R program, which is essentially um, the four R's of nutrient management. We wanna put um, fertilizers in the right place. You have a really big farm field, not all of that farm field may be deficient in certain nutrients. Now, historically, what farmers used to do, because you know a lot of the science is, is hard and complicated, is you know they wanna put just the, just the amount, the minimum amount that they can, but at the same time, they want to make sure they get good crop yields. So if we, if we basically, uh, in the past, there were a lot of people that would basically find the lowest level of, uh, um, they would go sample soil throughout a farm field, take the low, uh, lowest concentration nutrients and basically apply fertilizer based on that location. What was happening is for areas of a farm field that had, that were deficient in nutrients, there was, um, those were getting the right amount of nutrients. For other areas that may have had far more than they needed, those are still getting the same amount. So we were putting way too many nutrients on, on the entire farm field. So we wanna basically put the right amount of nutrients in the, in the right place on the farm field. We wanna use the right type. There are different types of fertilizers, whether it's manure, there's all sorts of synthetic fertilizers as well. 
We want to put the right amount of it. Um, and we want to put it in at the right time. If we apply fertile or something like manure, if we apply that on top of frozen ground and then we get a rain event, that'll all wash off that ice really, really rapidly. So we want to do all of that stuff uh, to keep those nutrients on farm fields. The other thing we want to do is we're seeing, you know, big changes in precipitation. And when you have more organic material in the soil, water can soak in much more rapidly. Those farm fields can absorb much more water, which is really, really important too. So doing things like cover crops and employing better soil health practices um, to help retain more of that water and more of those nutrients is gonna have a big impact. The other thing, you know, some of those nutrients are gonna run off the farm fields. So once they do get into the waterways, let's intercept it. Let's prevent them from ending up in Lake Erie. And there's a bunch of different ways that we do that. One of which are, are things like two-stage ditches, where historically uh, the dotted line would show one of our ditches in agricultural areas. If we can essentially create these like grass benches along those uh, ditches, um, whenever we get a big precipitation event, now that water is able to flow over that land and that's gonna help filter out a lot of the nutrients and also filter out soil and things like that. Reconnecting floodplains um, and, you know, essentially allows that water that's coming down to go up onto the landscape um, and help to decrease the uh, um, nutrients that are and, and the water flows that are ending up in the lake. The other big thing that I work on is uh, wetland restoration. And there's, there's far more to that than I'm gonna be able to get into on this presentation. But we're kind of, uh, one of the things that I do is work on restoring wetlands, uh, both in the coastal zone, as well as up in the watershed um, in areas, you know, like ag agricultural field to wetland conversion. We're kind of employing those same site types of uh, four R principles, right? The right type of wetlands in the right places, the right amount of it, because one of the things that we don't want to do, right? It, we could get rid of our uh, um, algal bloom issues if we take the entire Great Black Swamp, 1500 square miles or so, we turn the whole thing back to wetlands, we wouldn't have our algal blooms anymore. We also wouldn't have any people that lived up there anymore. We wouldn't have any agriculture there anymore. We all eat. So that's one of the challenges. And remember at the beginning, I talked about the Nature Conservancy. We try to use those pragmatic, non-confrontational solutions to conservation challenges like algal blooms. So we want to find the right places to put wetlands back on the landscape and the right amount of it, because we're not trying to, to, to get rid of farming or get rid of agriculture. We're trying to figure out ways that we can, you know, that our efforts the effort we put into this and the money, because these things are expensive to build and to do this work. We want to make sure that that money is being spent in the right location because we don't have endless amounts of money. Um, so we're trying to employ those same types of practices, put the right types of wetlands in the right locations uh, for the right kind of purposes. And we'll hopefully have some dramatic increases in terms of our water quality uh, as well as habitat. Um, so that, you know, there, there are, there's, again, I, I could talk about that stuff for, for days and days and days, um, why we do it, how we do it, but I wanted to make sure that I left some time for uh, questions. So with that, that, that's kind of the end of what I had, uh, and I am happy to take any questions people have. You're welcome to reach out to me. That's my uh, email address. Feel free to get in touch. If you're looking for ways to, to help, that's one of the questions that came up yesterday. Um, how, how you can get involved, there's, there's a bunch of things. One, you know, supporting groups like the Nature Conservancy. That's, you know, we are doing that. We're not the only game in town that does this sort of work, um, but we are working on, you know, this is the way that we work. So, you know, providing support for that. Being an active constituent, you know, telling your uh, elected representatives, hey, this stuff's important to us. Um, also just increasing the, you know, the appreciation of the region for these natural resources that are here, because that's something that Ohio kind of lacks that states like Michigan, um, that they appreciate a lot more. So anyway, all that said, um, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to try to answer them as best as I can. Hopefully we got some time to do that. We do, we have a couple minutes here, um, about 15 okay. minutes probably. Uh, but we had a few come in on Facebook and a few uh, in the webinar. So okay. I'll go to the one on Facebook first because it's pretty early on reference to that program, the early on in the program. If more would pass through the main dock, would that help the natural movement of sand from east to west? Would it make any difference in erosion? 
Uh, to be honest, probably not. Um, there's so, because there's so much, so much of that system has been altered. Uh, as soon as you start going farther east, there's a lot of other disruptions to that littoral sediment transport chain. Um, really, nowadays, there is relatively little sand that's moving along our shorelines in those areas. So it, it probably wouldn't have a dramatic impact on, on helping to kind of to nourish that area. So I, I wish I could say yes. Um, bypassing sand in a lot of areas is really, really important to preventing erosion downstream. But in the case of Lakeside's location, it probably wouldn't have a, a substantial impact on reducing erosion levels. Hmm. I've wondered that too. Um, okay, so we'll go over to the, the webinar questions so you might be able to see these too. Um, one of the first ones that came in was what's the continued impact of zebra mussels in the lake? Yeah, that's a good one. So zebra mussels have, there's that trade-off, right? Uh, zebra mussels, they absorb, they, they are basically, oops, zebra mussels filter. Let me go back to the, um, that kind of food web image. So zebra mussels are filter feeders uh, and they filter quagga mussels as well. Right now it's about half and half in zebra quagga mussels. They basically look the same. Um, both of those are invasive. They filter a tremendous amount of algae and a little bit of invertebrates as well, uh, and they eat it. So, so that's a good thing, right? They're reducing nutrient loading. Uh, they are reducing the amount of, they're helping to increase water clarity. The downside is they will only feed upon the good algae. They selectively, you may not think of filter feeders as selective, but they are. If, if there's a large harmful algal bloom that's in that location, they'll stop filtering. They won't eat till conditions are better. So they are helping to increase water clarity, uh, but at the same time, um, they are largely uh, only, they're eating the good bacteria or the good algae that all of these other things are eating. Um, they've had dramatic changes to, you know, not, not only to our infrastructure and stuff like that. This image does show them being eaten by some things and they are, I mean, you know, sheephead will eat some, Whitefish will eat some, gobies will nibble on them a little bit, yellow perch will eat, everything will eat some of them, but nothing eats much of them. Really, they have, they've, is it a good or is it a bad? It, it's hard to tell. It depends, you know, again, there's really no good or bad, but they are still to this day having that impact of a lot of those nutrients are being uptaken into the zebra mussels. They also have the impact of their feces. They're, they put out these pseudo feces. They basically, they filter through them, um, through that and they, you know, things that they can't digest or their waste, they basically throw out as like a little pellet. And that is highly concentrated nutrients, which can create more algal blooms later on at different times. So it, it just, it's, a, it's caused a dramatic change in, in the lakes ecosystem that, that still persists to today. I don't know if I answered that question, but hopefully it provided some, some background. No, I think that was great. That was a lot of, uh... There's a lot of connections between all of these. I love this food web too. It's yeah. nice to be able to see that all tied into one. Where where is this? Uh, who made this? The Great Lakes uh, Environmental. Is, yeah, exactly. Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. Uh, they they put off. They have a, a tremendous amount of resources uh, mm -hmm. for, of stuff like this. Uh, of all of the different Great Lakes uh, food webs they have. That's great. Um, so we have a two-part question. Okay. Um, what is the relationship approximately between Lake Erie's water elevation and the maximum water elevation? Oh, um, water elevation, um, i.e. if the lake is an inch higher this year, how much higher could the lake be during an extreme nor'easter storm surge? An inch. It, an it's inch. basically um, that sort of sage event. Uh, if water level today, say today, it's about three foot higher than long-term average, uh, long-term average being about 571.2 feet, three foot higher than then would basically add three foot onto the station event and the, the wave energies. So a lot of people ask that sort of question in relationship to uh, like East Harbor State Park's beach and when that eroded. If we had the same intensity storm event that, and, I, and I realized Lake Ear, or East Harbor's beach wasn't completely eroded in one event, but, but that one event, uh, Fourth of July storm, um, that derecho that came through that that was had a dramatic impact. You know, the majority of the erosion occurred during that event. If that same event happened today, 
we'll just hope it doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> we've been really lucky the past couple of years. In 2015, we had a pretty good nor'easter on, uh, um, what was it, end of June, late June. Uh, and the amount of Seish event that happened uh, in Marblehead, I can't remember, it was three, four foot or so, but water level rose. That same sort of storm event happening today would be the same amount of increase that Seish event over. And what I mean by Seish event um, is essentially we get a nor'easter, our water level rises here. And in Toledo, it's even more extreme than Marblehead. And on the flip side, it decreases over in Buffalo on the eastern side of the lake. Mm. So this is basically the lake, it's this bathtub effect, right? Where when it's blowing strongly, you know, the wind's coming this direction, it basically blows that water to the other end of the lake and it piles up on one side. And, you know, during a southwest wind, it will drop and in, in, uh, everything's backwards on Zoom, sorry. Um, when you get a strong southwest wind, water level here will drop in the western basin and it will rise in the eastern basin. On the flip side, in nor'easter, that's when we have all of our issues because that's when water level here rises up. And it's basically, it, it could rise up the same amount. So, uh, yeah, we've been really lucky. We've kind of dodged a bullet in that regard in terms of uh, water levels and station events. So, okay. current projections for water level. Is there a critical threshold at which significant damage flooding is projected? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, it depends. The water levels we see today, there are already roadways that are shut down. Uh, not as much in Marblehead. Marblehead is essentially an island, right? It's kind of in that Pelee Island, Kelly's Island, archipelago of islands. Um, it, it's an island. It sits up really high. Lakeside sits high. If you go to Port Clinton and you start going west towards Oak Harbor and those areas really into that Great Black Swamp region, uh, you're really, really, really low. So Marblehead wouldn't see the same sort of impacts in terms of flooding that a lot of the other coastal communities would. Um, Port Clinton, it, it already, if you go down to Port Clinton today, downtown Port Clinton, you'll see how high the water level is. And um, if we get it nor'easter right now, Port Clinton is gonna be in a world of hurt. Uh, is there projections for water level height in the future? Not really. It really is gonna depend on uh, precipitation. Uh, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron is still higher than it was last year. Um, due to the really, really, really dry conditions we had here in the Lake Erie watershed, um, our water didn't really go up any higher than it was last year. It was pretty similar to last year's. Um, but if this coming winter, so water level is always lower in the winter and it's always highest in summertime. If we have a really wet winter, uh, that's what, what we would get really, really concerned about for water level going up. So what, the sort of issue we'd see in Marblehead is really more of what we're seeing today, that sort of erosion on the shoreline, like at Lakeside. That's the sort of stuff that we would see here. The sort of infrastructure impacts. Um, on the tip of Marblehead, uh, on uh, 163 or Main Street, you know, that could continue, you know, that those sort of roads could continue to get eroded away. Um, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, compared to other folks who are in lower line areas, it wouldn't be quite as bad. So hopefully that answered the questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm always curious. I used to live over in Port Clinton, and I keep wondering yeah. what it is that they're going to do to um, try to stop some of that flooding. It's just inevitable. Uh, All the way back. Yeah, the, they are. They're facing the same sort of impacts that uh, um, that like the East Coast deals with with sea level rise. Mm -hmm. um, there is no good solution. There really isn't. Uh, there is hope that maybe we could, you know, could they build up the shoreline? Sure, but even today, you know. A lot of their storm sewers, you know, are, are basically they're, they're pumping lake level or they're paper, pumping water out of lake water back into the lake uh, mm -hmm. just to keep it out of the roadways and things. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure in Port Clinton. Uh, if you've driven by the beach, one of the reasons they have the Port Clinton City Beach all that roped off is they have their electrical lines that feed all their pumps downtown. You know, there's a good amount of Port Clinton today that sits below lake level with the high water we have. They're able to keep water pumped out of it. But if we get a big nor'easter, we get a lot of rain, um, that, uh, uh, that infrastructure, that electro, those electrical conduit lines, some of those have been exposed uh, from the beach, from underneath the beach. If those things were ruptured, now we'd lose the capacity to pump water out of Port Clinton. And if mm -hmm. that happened, it would happen during a storm. So, you know, Port Clinton is in a much, much more precarious sort of situation than, than Marblehead is. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so then we have an interesting question that came in on Facebook. Um, this okay. might be the last one. 
but I am acquainted with many people, often from rural areas, who still believe that climate change is not related to man's impact on the environment. What do you say to these folks? Uh, they're wrong. <laughs> um, we, you know, like you saw some of that stuff in terms of, you know, the climate has been warming. Ever since the end of the ice age, it has been warming. That's it, absolutely true. It really has. Um, but when we look at that, when that occurred, you know, we're talking 20,000 years, 10,000 years to get to where we are today. What we're seeing is historically, we have been seeing, you know, a rise in, in uh, if you want to call it in terms of global temperature, um, which global temperature on average is, it, you know, varies tremendously, right? But we are seeing a little bit of a rise slowly over time. But the, the problem is, is that anthropogenic climate change has taken what is a relatively slow rise and it's causing it to do this. So that rate of increase is dramatically, dramatically changing. So when, when I showed you that one image, I wonder if I can go back. Sorry for skipping through all this stuff. Okay, so like this image, I like this one a lot because it kind of shows what our climate is looking like. And because people have a general sense of, you know, what Oklahoma or Arkansas or, you know, Carolina's climate looks like. Yeah, Ohio's climate is heading that direction. Whether humans are, are contributing to, to that climate change or not. The difference is we are very likely to hit this, you know, around the turn of the century right now. Whereas otherwise it may have taken thousands of years to reach that. That's a huge, huge, huge change. And plants and animals will adapt and they can adapt and they can migrate and they can move. But when we get that change that's so much more rapid, that really strains those systems and the capacity for those systems and those animals and plants and things to be able to move and to migrate. So are humans having an impact on it? Yeah, absolutely, unquestionably so. Um, there, is no, there is no debate among that, uh, about that. Uh, you know, maybe from uh, politicians and things like that, but the science really is clear. Uh, on that, that it's, it, it is occurring, it is happening. And now it's just, how bad is it going to be? Are we going to be able to kind of prevent it? Are we, th is this going to be, you know, at the turn of the century, is Ohio's climate going to be here in the summertime? Or is it going to be here in the summertime? That's kind of the big question now is how bad is it, or how, how big of a change is it going to be, right? And even that, you could say there are trade-offs. Some people don't like our cold winters. Some people may look at this and say, man, I'd love to be like, uh, winter time to be like Eastern uh, Virginia mm -hmm. and North Carolina in the winter. I mean, that's, that's, that's a perfectly valid way to look at it. <laughs> I, I, I look at that and say, that's not a good thing, but you know, I mean, trade-offs, right? So. Mm -hmm. And thinking it's just Ohio, it's not just Ohio, it's changing all of them. Oh, like no. Climate change is going to affect everybody even worse. So. Exactly. And what, like what we saw in uh, Michigan, Midland, Michigan this year, up in the, um, lower peninsula up here where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they had those precipitation event, you know, that those big deluges and all the flooding, they had a 500 year flood event. What that means is you would expect that amount of water to come in once every 500 years, we would expect that kind of event to happen. We're seeing that happen frequently now. Uh, a once in 100 year flood event is now occurring about once every 30 years. So these are like catastrophic conditions that are occurring much, much, much more frequently. And that's really what, what this is essentially showing, uh, is the increase in that sort of variation in precipitation trends. So, yeah. Well, it's all very amazing and a little bit overwhelming, but it's good to know and to see and be learning about it. So I appreciate yeah. you sharing everything with us. Sorry, I'm not trying to make people worry. There's enough going <laughs> on to make people worry in the world nowadays. So. No, no, it's a good thing. It's an awareness that we, we want for everyone. Um, I will say, so tomorrow our Lake Erie or our Lakeside Environmental Stewardship Society is also having a program that ties pretty closely into this. Laura Johnson, um, who's the director for quality, water quality research at uh, Heidelberg is going to be doing a program on how tributaries affect um, harmful algal blooms. Um, so that'll be on tomorrow and uh, folks can watch it. We'll hopefully have it streaming live on Facebook too, but the webinar can be found on our calendar and that's going to be at 1.30 on Wednesday. Um, so and please just... don't tell her I forgot to put them on my uh, um, partner slide. 
on well, the Heidelberg parks. National Center for Water Quality Research should also be on there. <laughs> okay, well, she can she can talk about it then tomorrow. And we'll, we'll add that into the promotions. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, thank you for some great questions. We're, we're um, glad to have everyone getting, um, getting involved and uh, wanting to learn more. And as Matt said, he's open for questions and I'm sure he'd love to hear more from all of you, but thank you again for, for today and for yesterday and for all the information, Matt. Sure, no problem. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening in. Yeah. All right. Well, we're sending everybody love from Lakeside and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>